everybody. I'm Andy Miller. I'm faculty member in the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems, and I serve as the uh, organizer for our departmental seminar series. Welcome today to our uh, presentation by Jack Schmidt from Utah State University. I'm going to ask uh, Nick Kurtz, who is one of our graduate students and co-host um, for today's seminar, to actually introduce our speaker, and then we will move on to put uh, Jack on stage. Uh, so. Nick, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, Jack Smith, the Janet Quinney Lawson Chair in Colorado River Studies in the Waterfed Sciences Department at Utah State University, where he leads the Center for Colorado River Studies and the Future of the Colorado River Project. He won the Director's Award from the National Park Service for his career of applied river research concerning the large regulated rivers of the National Park System and he was a member of the team who received the Partners in Conservation Award from the Secretary of the Interior for their work planning and conducting the 2014 pulse flow release into the Colorado River Delta in Mexico. Between 2011 and 2014, he served as Chief of the U.S. Geological Survey's Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center. Dr. Schmidt completed his bachelor's degree in political science at Bucknell University his master's degree in geography at University of California, Berkeley, and his uh, PhD in geography and environmental engineering at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Schmidt. Okay, thanks, Nick. Nick, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And it's uh, great to be with you. Um, I'm at Utah State University, so I owe you one. Um, because uh, you shared your basketball coach with Utah State University, Ryan Odom. Uh, we, I guess we <laughs> recruited, <laughs> who knows how that works. But anyway, your UMBC basketball coach is now our basketball coach. And uh, he just finished his season last night uh, in our NIT game in which we got blown out by the University of Oregon. So here we are. Uh, it is great to be with you. And um, uh, I'm just trying to get warmed up here. So um, what I want to talk to you today about is sort of provide a, an overview of the big issues that face the Colorado River. Um, I'm just trained as a geomorphologist. Um, I had the pleasure um, to earn my PhD uh, at Hopkins with Andy and Stu Schwartz and many others in a broad department that focused on water resources and um, in many aspects of the issues associated with managing water. And you're going to see that theme in my talk today. Um, I've been at, the, I started working in the Colorado River almost 40 years ago. I'm at the end of my career. I've written my share of papers on river geomorphology and how things work and how rivers behave and how they've changed. Um, that's not really what I'm going to talk about today. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, the issue of managing this river. And um, this really comes about uh, when I, uh, so for three and a half years during the Obama administration, I led the GCMRC, the main science provider to the Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program. I was an employee of the US Geological Survey. When I returned to Utah State University, I wanted to continue to make a difference in the Colorado River. And as an academic um, on a river that has a heavy government agency management over print, um, I knew that my job wasn't to try to replicate what government agencies did. Um, I also knew that um, I didn't want to just spend my time chasing a few contracts with federal agencies and doing what, you know, I was asked to do. I guess I was too old and stubborn for that. Um, so what I wanted to do was essentially uh, create a center 
which could ask the questions or take a perspective that government agencies can't take simply because there are many ways in which the whole management of the Colorado River is boxed in by uh, the politics of managing the river. And so my job now, self-appointed, is to try to think out of the box. And so uh, that's a perspective and the group that I lead uh, accomplishes that. So without further ado, let's let's dive into this. Oh, now, Andy, let's see if I can actually, okay. Uh, oh, that's good. All right, it worked. <laughs> okay. Um, for more than 100 years, since the early 1900s, uh, the Colorado River has been referred to as America's Nile. Why America's Nile? Because the original development focus of the Colorado River was at its far downstream end, uh, with the routing of water to Southern California and the Imperial Valley, um, and, uh, and, and now today to Phoenix and Tucson by the Central Arizona Project Canal. And yet, just like the Nile, the water all comes from the distant headwaters. And so it's essentially uh, the watershed of the Colorado River is an upside down version of the Nile with water coming from a far distant source originally to fuel these economies in the lower basin. And then today, much like the dilemmas on the modern Nile River, river development in the upstream end, in the case of the Nile, that's the development uh, in Ethiopia and in the upper in the upper Colorado River, it's a diversion of water to Salt Lake, the Colorado Front Range, Albuquerque. Um, those uh, in in part uh, are the dilemmas and questions of today, albeit with the overprint that um, the amount of water in the system is uh, decreasing. In this plot, and I'm going to show a few of these, so so, um, so a few of my slides will, will involve lots of information. Um, this is the hydrology of the Colorado River in the early 20th century, a period of unusually wet conditions. And these values here are the mean annual flow of different segments of the river. The upper Colorado River, the Green River, the San Juan River, the main stem below the confluence at Lee's Ferry, and the main stem further downstream. And these values are in units of millions of acre feet. And I appreciate that some of you are appalled that I would use a, a value like that, but those are the kind of numbers that we live in, in management of the Colorado River. So no metric uh, SI units in this talk. Um, and uh, the fact that, that, and these are simply the average annual total flow of the river at different places based on all the available gauging prior to 1929. And the periods of record are slightly different. And so the fact that it's 20 million acre feet in near Topak um, on the Colorado River and 17 million below, uh, at, at the international border is not uh, anything other than slightly different averaging periods. So the key is that the numbers are in numbers like 15 to 20 million acre feet were in the river wet water uh, gauged by the USGS in the early 20th century when the Colorado River Compact was negotiated. And these are the average hydrographs of the river. 
down near the mouth, uh, Atlee's Ferry, and then the three headwater branches. The median value of that hydrograph is in dark red, and then the range uh, shown by the dashed lines is the interquartile range of 50% uh, of the years during the averaging period. And you can see that the distinctive attribute of the hydrology of the river is the snowmelt flood that had a slightly different uh, uh, duration. The San Juan River was definitely the smallest of the headwater branches, and they combined to create the great flood through the Grand Canyon that persisted all the way through to the Sea of Cortez into Mexico, a flood that had an average or median value at its peak of somewhere around 80,000 cubic feet per second and could reach above 100,000 cubic feet per second. So that's what the old river looked like that was divided up in the negotiation of the compact. The Colorado River is distinctive for its high sediment load. The widths of these bars is proportional to the mean annual undisturbed fine sediment load of the river um, at the, um, uh, uh, you know, in the early part of the 20th century and the Colorado River delivered more sediment to the sea than any other tributary in the United States, except for the Missouri River system. The Colorado River had a distinctive fish assemblage. 75% of the fish species of the Colorado River are endemic to that watershed and live nowhere else on Earth. And those species developed in the context of a river that not only had a very large snowmelt flood and a low winter flow season and had an unusually high sediment load during the flood periods, but also varied in temperature from very warm in summer to very cold in winter. These temperatures are at the head of the Grand Canyon. So a native fish uh, assemblage somewhat depauperate in the number of species, but unique and adapted to the attributes of a very wide ranging river. Uh, these are some images of the old Colorado River with Cottonwood Gallery forests along its uh, margins. And in its canyons, a, um, a, a narrow band of riparian vegetation or even no vegetation whatsoever in the Grand Canyon. At its lower end along the California-Arizona border, the river was actually navigable by sidewheel steamboats uh, with shallow draft that supplied the mining camps along the river. And Yuma was actually an interior port where boats traveling through the Delta in Mexico then shifted their gear to steamboats to deliver to the, um, to the um, mining camps. The river was navigable. In the Delta itself in Mexico, it was one of the most biologically diverse places in North America, a river that had this enormous annual flood through a very hot landscape uh, described by Aldo Leopold in a chapter in Sand County Almanac. The river is fundamentally different today. It is fundamentally different primarily because in places the river has been so significantly diverted for off-channel uses. But we want to distinguish between 
the effect of diversions because of the simple fragmentation of the of the uh, river because of that those diversions in contrast to um, the magnitude of those diversions. And then we also want to consider the effects of dams and reservoirs, whether it's a fragmentation caused by the existence of those structures or how those reservoirs are operated. Those produce different kinds of effects. The dewatering of rivers has caused their shrinkage and some rivers in the upper watershed, in this case, the San Rafael River, have been significantly dewatered. This is a pre-diversion and post-diversion hydrograph and the rivers have shrunk. And at times the San Rafael River in this location is completely dry. But at the far downstream end of the river in the Delta, Here's an old photograph, and this is the delta today. Not a drop of water at all, except in rare cases of downstream uh, rains in the delta and in the desert or during the intentional release in 2014. Fragmentation has blocked the natural um, migration of fish throughout the watershed and, uh, the, and led to uh, federal endangered status for many of the main stem species. The reservoirs block the flux of organic matter and block the flux of fine sediment that uh, incrementally fills reservoirs like Lake Powell. Reservoir operations downstream from some of these reservoirs have completely changed the flow regime. Here is the flow regime of the Colorado River at the head of the Grand Canyon. This is the pre-dam period. This is a post-dam period. The reason it's a green swath is that's the effect of hydropower operations and the river going up and down every day. The base flows are actually higher today. So this is reservoir operations in a part of the river that has water in it in contrast to a place like the Delta, which is completely dewatered. If we take a step back and say, what's the effect of all of that on today's river? I've now overprinted in blue the hyd average hydrology of the river in the 21st century compared it to red, the prior plots that I showed you of the river 100 years ago. You can see that the hydrology of the upstream tributary still retains a snowmelt flood, whether it's in the Green River or the Upper Colorado River. But you can see that, for instance, in the Upper Colorado River, the interquartile range of the modern river doesn't even overlap the interquartile range of the early 20th century river. And look at the magnitude of the change on the San Juan River. This is the river today. And then when we come downstream below Glen Canyon Dam in the Grand Canyon, the river today looks absolutely nothing like the hydrology of the old river. And then after all the water is taken out at the international border, here is the river today. Philip Fradkin wrote a book in the 1970s said, uh, titled his book, A River No More. And that's the case in the Delta. So this is a river no more. This is a river through Grand Canyon, a completely altered hydrology. And in the upper basin, it sort of has a similar hydrology to what it once uh, looked like, but uh, a much more muted uh, effect. And this is the effect to be clear of diversions, of flow regulation, but also a changing climate.
with decreasing runoff in the watershed. This is the thermal regime of the river today. At times when the, because reservoirs thermally stratify and because the withdrawal points in the reservoir are at depth, when the reservoirs are relatively full, water is withdrawn from the hypolimnion of the reservoir. And therefore, the withdrawals are typically cooler than was the case in the unregulated pre dam era. And that is especially the case in Grand Canyon, where the rivers um, have historically, in the post dam era, been cooler than summer conditions in the unregulated era. The rivers in the upper basin are more thermally like they once were because the dams are further upstream. There are some unregulated tributaries, but this change in the thermal structure of the river and the linkage to the, of that thermal structure with the thermal stratification of reservoirs has really created a very different and novel thermal regime. Combined with the fact that non-native species have been introduced into the river system, both in the reservoirs as warm water reservoir game fish like smallmouth bass, and also um, to introduce cold water non-native trout to the tailwaters immediately downstream from the dams. So we have novel species, we have a novel thermal regime, we have a novel hydro flow regime, and we have a novel sediment regime. We have these native fish that hold on but evolved in a completely different flow regime and thermal regime, and combined we have the creation of novel aquatic ecosystems in the post-dam world. And the challenge of, of having novel ecosystems is as we go forward in the brave new world, we ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, is this the kind of novel ecosystem we want in the future? Do we want to preserve what we have um, now? Do we want to try to go back to what we had in the early 20th century? Do we want to create even something different going forward? Let me take a second now to completely shift gears and say, how is the river managed today? The river is managed by a set of compacts, treaties, Supreme Court rulings, laws and agreements that is collectively called the law of the river. And there is a structure of priority to how that law is implemented that is not necessarily based on um, the fact that the Colorado River Compact is the oldest of the agreements but sort of the structure of ruling such that the most important uh, guidance is our, our need to fulfill an obligation to deliver to Mexico 1.5 million acre feet of water. Notice or remember that the flows in the early 20th century were on the order of 17 million acre feet. So Mexico sort of gets less than 10% of what it was flowing naturally into the Delta more than a century ago. Uh, tribal rights are senior to everybody else, but tribal rights um, uh, remain in strong contention. And then the lower basin uh, essentially has uh, somewhat more senior rights because of how the compact was written. We'll get into that in a bit. Uh, the upper basin um, uh, has its rights uh, divided by percentages, but here's a number to keep in mind. If you sort of take the casual way that the compact 
and all in the law of the river is um, administered, each basin sort of imagined it would get 7.5 million acre feet. Mexico gets 1.5 million acre feet. The lower basin gets another million acre feet. Uh, so we're, what are we at? We're at 15, 16.5, 17.5. Then we have to consider reservoir evaporation. It's a number that's in excess of 17 or 18 million acre feet. Keep that in mind. How much water flows in the river? Well, at the time the Colorado River uh, Compact was first negotiated, the average annual natural flow estimated by reclamation, um, this is the amount of water that would be in the river if there were no diversions, um, was about 18 million acre feet in the early 20th century. Even those USGS gauging data that I showed you um, from the earliest 20th century, there were already diversions in place. But here's the problem. A number like 18 million when the first agreements were negotiated. For the rest of the 20th century, the natural flow, 14 million. But water development had not yet kicked into full gear, and this is before even part of this period before the big dams were um, constructed. Since the, we entered the 21st century, the mean annual flow of the river has been 12.4 million acre feet. 12 is a lot less than 18. And when you have negotiated agreements that sort of imagine that 18 million is the amount to be divided when the actual natural flow of the river now is 12, that creates political conflict. How much water is used today in the basin? The lower basin is fully developed. The average annual consumptive use since the year 2001 has been 7.4 million acre feet. Mexico has actually uh, been delivered slightly more than 1.5 million acre feet. We've got reservoir evaporation, um, which is um, on the order of 1.3 million acre feet. In the upper basin, only about half of what the upper basin imagines it has available for use is actually used today. The diversion systems and the amount of agriculture in the upper basin has significantly lagged. But if you add up all these numbers, it takes us to about 15 million acre feet of water used of the main stem river, if we don't count the Gila, that's a political minefield. 15 is a bigger number than 12, which is what the natural flow of the river has been. That's a problem. How in the world do you consume 15 million acre feet of water in the Colorado River Basin if only 12 million is coming into the system? How you do it is you drain the reservoirs. And this is um, the storage in Lake Mead. And pay attention to since we began the uh, 21st century here, the reservoir, and this is the amount of water in light blue stored in Lake Powell. Since two, and in 2000, the reservoir, Mead and Powell were approximately full. And Mead and Powell are the two largest reservoirs in the United States. And the way that you sustain a higher use than the natural flow is that you drain the bank account. So, where do we stand today? 
Lake Powell's capacity is 25 million acre feet. Today, it is less than um, 25% full. Lake Mead is less than 35% full. If we add up all the smaller reservoirs in the system, the total system contents are 36% full. So the problem is, if we are in a new normal and if the conditions of the climate and the conditions of the 21st century are what's going to persistently lie ahead, and we've got consumptive uses that have been maintained by draining the bank account, but if the income is always going to be less, then we're in big trouble as a nation. The projections of the future, and these are two-year projections into the future of Lake Powell and Lake Mead, are that there is a distinct possibility that each reservoir will go below the elevation needed to produce any hydroelectricity at all. <clears throat> because the withdrawal structures to withdraw water called the penstocks withdraw water into the power plants, and as the reservoirs drop, we're beginning to withdraw water, not from the hypolimnium, but from the warm water of the surface of the reservoirs. These um, uh, color-coded reservoir thermal profiles of Lake Powell obviously show that in, in early fall, we're withdrawing warm water and in the winter, obviously, the reservoir temperature cools, but the reservoir in the summer of this coming year is going to be even lower than it was last year. And so we're going to start withdrawing water out of the epilimnium and change the entire thermal structure of the Colorado River in Grand Canyon. And so the projections of likely temperatures of releases are going to be unprecedented in their um, warmth in relationship to the entire era of time in which these new novel ecosystems developed in the Grand Canyon. And because the, the uh, fish community structure of the Grand Canyon is now a very different place than it was 100 years ago, um, it's going to benefit not just native fish, but also non-native fish. And we have to worry about the species interactions between the uh, native and non-native uh, fish. So the world is about to change for ecosystems as well as um, um, for water supply. What's going to determine the future of the river? The future of the river is partly going to be determined by the future of a changing climate and how the runoff patterns um, will change. But it's also going to be determined by the new negotiations of getting the consumptive uses in the watershed in balance with the new supply and it's going to depend on how the reservoirs are reoperated when there's different patterns of inflow and consumptive uses. And the effects of this, well, so the important thing is the future of the river is not solely determined by simply how climate change affects watershed runoff. Very importantly, it's also determined by um, how society responds to a changing climate. It's the management response to the hand that is forced by a change uh, of, of watershed runoff. And all of this is going to change um, the flow regime, the sediment supply, the water quality, and the aquatic and riparian ecosystems. 
the changes that lie ahead uh, in this brave new world in terms of the future runoff are not unprecedented. We have had other droughts, but the system was not fully built out in the mid 20th century and in the paleo tree ring record, we have evidence of longer, more persistent droughts. But some of you may be familiar with the work of Park Williams at UCLA, who now has uh, looked at the full record and reevaluated the tree ring record and has concluded that the conditions in the watershed today are now unprecedented in more than a thousand years. But the climate continues to warm, and let me just more quickly go through this. We don't know what the rate of temperature increase in the atmosphere will be. It depends on our ability to, to control greenhouse gases. But what's important in the Colorado River is that there is a linkage between a warming climate and a decrease in runoff because a, because a warming climate is shifting the snowpack conditions in the Rockies, the sublimation, the dryness of the soils means that a lot of the snowpack goes into the dry soils and never makes it to the rivers. And the duration of the period of evapotranspiration, the elevation of the tree line is all changing such that a warming climate is leading to decreased runoff. And this work, Chris Milley, folks at Princeton, folks elsewhere in the USGS are projecting and looking at decreases in watershed runoff relative to how much is the decrease in runoff in relationship to how much the climate um, uh, warms. And so we have different emission scenarios. We have different projections of how much runoff is gonna decline in relationship to a warming climate. We don't know what it's gonna be. This would be an optimistic control of the climate. This would be a pessimistic control of the climate. This would be an increasing sense, a high sensitivity of runoff. We don't know what the future will be. These are different scenarios. But when you look at out into the future, let's look at mid 20th century under different warming scenarios and different sensitivities of runoff, and this is the projected annual flow at Lee's Ferry. And the thing to keep in mind is we're now using 15 million acre feet of water a year. And these numbers are all less than 15 million. That's a problem. What do we do? Well, as a friend of mine who uh, had a high level uh, in the interior department with whom I worked with when I was at the USGS once said, the law of the river is whatever we say it is. And the, and the stakeholders of the basin are desperately trying to implement and negotiate changes in the law of the river to try to reduce consumptive uses. Um, what's at stake in these negotiations? Well, in the upper basin, the upper basin states have always projected that in the future, they will relentlessly approach that 7.5 million acre feet that they thought they um, had agreed to, right? But they only use 3.7 today. So in the upper basin, the negotiation is whether the upper basin can someday ever use this imaginary and aspire to additional um, uh, amount of water that they think they have always might someday use, or whether they're just gonna get to hold on to their average, 
or whether in fact their use of water might actually have to decrease. I would point out that more that 70% of the consumptive uses in the upper basin are used by irrigated agriculture. In the lower basin, the lower basin is already fully tapped out. It's not going to get any more water. The, this, these numbers are the amount of water on average in the river uh, released out of Hoover Dam and then successively depleted by the Colorado River Aqueduct to LA and Southern California, the Central Arizona Project Canal, big diversions in the Imperial Valley diverted to Mexico, no water gets to the sea. If we're gonna reduce water consumption in the lower basin, it's reducing real wet water uses. And the Central Arizona Project is the most junior water right in the basin. And, um, and, and is now already reducing deliveries to central Arizona, namely to Phoenix and Tucson. That's a big deal. Um, we've projected and modeled um, with the future of the Colorado River team, this is not work that I do, um, what it would take to reach a sustainable level of future um, a use in the basin, and, and the important point is this is modeling projections that we use different scenarios of future inflows to, to, to Lake Powell out of the basin. This is the uncertainty range in the projections. And if we pursue business as usual and the lower basin doesn't reduce its water use and the upper basin continues to grow, then the average of those projections is that we tank the system, we can't produce electricity, and the rivers are perpetually low, or the reservoirs are perpetually low. If everybody cuts and the lower basin drastically cuts its water use, then we can reach a sustainable level. This is the total storage in Mead and Powell this is the dead minimum to produce a water level. But so the good news is we can hypothetically imagine that we could achieve ways to reduce consumptive water use. But what that would take would be draconian cuts in the lower basin, which are surely not politically acceptable. So therein lies the dilemma. The upper basin giving up its hopes and dreams, the lower, uh, the upper basin, the lower basin desperately trying to figure out how to cut and who to cut. And, and so the, the, the option is to consider trade offs of balancing and reducing some upper basin use. And these are different scenarios of combinations of upper and lower basin cuts that would re reach new sustainable levels in Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, this is if the present conditions in the basin are the new normal, 12.3 million acre feet. If climate warming continues and the watershed runoff continues to get even lower and lower, then we don't reach sustainability and we are in a real difficult bind. As the reservoirs get lower, the temperature regimes will change and the river ecosystems are undoubtedly going to change. And with that, I wanna stop and just say there are enormous trade-offs in the ecosystem that some people like and some people don't and let me close with this. The message is climate change is reducing watershed runoff. It necessitates a political response. It necessitates renegotiation of all of the agreements that require management changes in reservoir operations and rules. We're trying to get the just to do this is the enormous challenge of 
the upper and lower base and deciding who's going to reduce more. As all of this goes forward, it changes the ecosystem drivers of the rivers because it changes the reservoir storage contents in the reservoirs, which will change the ecosystems of every river segment in the upper basin and in Grand Canyon. That is the fate of the river in the future. It is uncertain. It is um, challenging the federal and state governments and the science community is deeply invested in all of this. Thanks. That's it, Andy. Thanks, Jack. That's a lot to digest and a lot to think about. I'm going to invite people to put questions into the chat and then we will call on you to unmute and ask your question, um, basically in the order in which the questions come in. Um, so if you were all looking for a rosy prediction, I'm sorry you didn't get it. Um, but uh, it's it's a it's fascinating, disturbing at the same time. Um, I'm going to ask: Does anybody anybody ready to ask a question? Because I could ask one right away. But uh, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much for your talk. Um, it was really interesting, and I'm also um, I'm from uh, I'm from a, a small town in New Mexico. Um, Reynoso, and we, uh, one of the things that comes up there about, um, particularly our, um, our reservoir use in our watershed is, um, saving for access for, um, fighting fires, uh, wildfires in particular. And that is, um, that's a significant draw for our small reservoir, um, that, you know, we have our fire season, um, every spring and now it's not just relegated to spring, early summer, but. That dry season is now much um, longer in the year, um, and so I'm I'm thinking about as like as we're thinking about um, renegotiating agreements and what major draws to these um, water sources are, you know, can some of those um, some of that renegotiation process also include not just like climate change in terms of its impacts on on drought and lower precipitation, all that kind of stuff and heat. Um, evaporation, but also about the need for this um, larger use of water that will be projected in the future as well. Yeah, um, you know, the, 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 the geography of water storage, Chris, um, in the Colorado River, I mean, every watershed has its own unique distribution of water storage. I mean, the thing to keep in mind is essentially, um, I don't know, let, use a round number, it's something like 90% or 85% of all the water storage in the Colorado River system is in Powell and Mead, okay? In these two enormous reservoirs in the middle of absolute desert. Now, those reservoirs are not used for fire, fire. I mean, they're just big, enormous water storage facilities that also, you know, the releases produce important hydropower. Um, you're talking about the small headwater reservoirs um, and um, in many, I don't know, you know, nobody touches water anywhere in the Colorado River system and doesn't have to worry about the law of the river. So um, I, I, I can't tell you whether the operations of the small headwater reservoirs really affect large scale water supply, but I will tell you that the changing picture of wildfire in the West is having enormous impacts. You're absolutely right that it, it affects sediment yield in the reservoirs, the lifespan of the reservoirs. Um, and it's an important concern. Um, uh, it isn't part of the regular conversation of, that I talked about, um, but it, it's a hugely important issue. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Other questions? Amita. Hi, yes, um, I, this is more like a comment and I, I want to share a link here. Um, that NASA has a Western water applications office um, and uh, both upper and lower Colorado basin are observed through a variety of remote sensing observations. And um, they're trying to provide information to 
to reduce or at least manage uh, water resources better. And so I just put a link in the chat. Uh, there is a water portal. It includes most Western states and up to Colorado River, both upper and lower basins. They have done detailed study of Columbia River and now they're planning to do the same for Colorado River. So I thought I'll just mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing that uh, Andy, I'd like to mention, I just, I just want to move this slide. This is a website of the Center for Colorado River Studies. Um, I, I admit that I blew through an immense amount of water resource engineering um, uh, with a few casual slides at the end. Uh, we write uh, significant white papers. Those white papers can be downloaded at this website, the center's website. We've uh, we've been putting out these uh, white papers for several years. And um, if anybody wants to look in detail, we've got one white paper on scenarios of hydrologic future scenarios um, led by David Tarbotten of the uh, engineering school here at Utah State. Our, our water resource modeling has been led by Kevin Wheeler at Oxford and a uh, longtime uh, user of the Colorado River simulation system written in Riverware, which is a main modeling tool for water resource operations. But if you want to look at um, any of these white papers, this is where they can be downloaded. Andy, back to you. Thanks. Other questions? I'm ready to ask one if nobody wants to jump in, but I want to give people an opportunity. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask. So, so obviously, it's a very complex web of interrelationships, not only hydrologic, but also political. And so, <laughs> one of the things that occurs to me when you're talking about if we don't cut use dramatically and we wind up with reservoir pool levels falling below the level needed to reduce power. Some of the same jurisdictions that need the water also need the power. And if they can't rely on the water power, um, that means I presume they're going to make more use of other sources such as fossil fuels. Has this been an ongoing discussion also? Uh, yes. Um... The hydropower issue is, is its own convoluted mess. I think the first most important thing to say is water supply is more important than hydropower. Okay, that's just the way it is. Um, now, Southern California is a triple redundant water supply system. Water comes in the Colorado River, comes in Northern California out of the Sacramento River, and it comes out of the Owens River in the Owens Valley. Um, but uh, nevertheless, water supply and irrigated agriculture is, is most important. Um, uh, uh, and uh, let me just... Andy, I'm just going to just just bear with me a minute because I think that uh, people are going to be fascinated if I um, can find this. Um, oh, I, um, oh, nuts. I'm sorry. Uh, I can't. All right. Well, let's just leave it that California is the um, the most important um, uh, energy consumer in the basin, and the use here it is. So, um, Andy, am I? Um, uh, hold on a second here. I'm seeing presenter view right now. But I'm what? not seeing whatever slide you're looking for. Uh, I have a website I want to bring up. How oh. do I do that? Um, so I'll tell you what. Well, you can either go to that website. No, okay. Screen. Now share. Hold on a second. Let me just show everybody um, this. Can everybody see this screen? Yeah. This is 
uh, energy use by source in California. This is tracked on a minute by minute basis. Okay. This is California. This green line here is renewable energy. This is solar power. When at 7 a.m. the sun came up in California and renewable energy became the primary source of energy throughout California, particularly in all of Southern California. So one of the things about the effect of hydropower is that the face of energy is dramatically changing in the West. We used to say that when people woke up, we needed peaking power and we needed hydropower to meet that energy demand. Now on a summer day, uh, we go to the world is changing. And so I would say, Andy, that we're struggling with this and everybody realizes that uh, the face and the role of hydropower is significantly changing in the West. And we don't know what that role is going to be. So you're right, decreased water supply in the reservoirs has enormous potential impacts, but it's not the same sort of impacts that it might have been 20 years ago. The face of the power industry is changing. That's all I wanted to share with you. Thanks. Stu Schwartz has a question. Yeah, thanks, Andy, and, and, and thanks, Jack, for a re really terrific talk. Um, I, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about uh, some of the ecological impacts, and in particular, uh, to draw the distinction between what some might call stocks and flows. You know, when you talk about irrigation or water supply, we talk about the need in terms of a volume, how many acre feet. When we talk about many of the ecological needs, it strikes me that we're really talking about a flow, a continuous uh, flow rate that's required for those ecological benefits. And in many cases where there are diversions from the river, if the choice is between keeping water in the river to maintain that flow, and as it flows past the intake from the con uh, consumptive users or the water supply perspective, that water is quote, wasted. It, it just flows downstream without beneficial use. And thinking about it that way, I just wonder what your thoughts are uh, about the prospects for the ecological uh, uh, needs and consequences in the in the basin. Because, as you know, from your presentation, it struck me that um, um, in many ways, um, the ecological goals, the, the ecosystem is hosed, <laughs> right? I mean, yes. if, you, yeah, if you're yeah, ratcheting yeah, yeah. down consumptive use to the bare minimum that this system right. can support, right. yeah, what's yeah. left for the ecosystem? Right. Um, so the so the most important point uh, in answer to your question is the answer is it depends where. <laughs> no, in in the Colorado River. This is really an important point. So let's look at the look at these changes in hydrograph. In the delta down here, the ecosystem is destroyed. Uh, let me just be blunt here under the cone of silence of an academic presentation. Um, that's a completely hosed ecosystem. And when we talk about releasing water to Mexico into the Delta confined by levees, what we're talking about here is this is a river that has become an ephemeral sandy wash, right. an ephemeral sandy wash. So you're talking about minimum flows. This, the, the issue here is what kind of an ecosystem do we want to create? Because we have to create one. Now, between Hoover and the border, the numbers go from 9.5 to 1.4. And this river is 50% converted to reservoirs. The river channel is degraded. This is mitigation and creation, period. So, but the only place where minimum flows really occur as, as an issue is way down here. In the rest of this, 
this river looks like the Columbia River with little segments of river stuck in between big reservoirs, right. okay? Then we go to Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon's problem is not about water. Grand Canyon's problem is how is the water released? There's no problem of um, minimum, hell, there's no problem of minimum flow in the Grand Canyon. If anything, the Grand Canyon has too much water for its depauperate sediment regime. So the problem in Grand Canyon is this is a hydro, this is a regime in which these are mean daily flows in which the flows are highest in winter and in the air, in the heating and air conditioning season. Right. But the flows here have, are the problem is not too little water. The problem is the flow regime. In the San Juan, the problem is, is can we define a minimum flow when the state of New Mexico and the Navajo Nation want to take more water out? Here, the problem is what you just asked. And then I would say there are little rivers, like that's the Dolores River. That river, this river has been destroyed by enormous diversions. The San Rafael River is dr basically dry. In these rivers, they're drain dry, and the only solution is your the answer to your question, which is, can we establish a minimum flow? And the answer is right now, no. But that is the solution. But the effort in other in the in the green and the upper Colorado is can we simply maintain that and that there's enough water. But the dilemma um I guess the other question is, um, so some of these ecosystems have been completely destroyed. The San Rafael, the San Juan's in pretty bad shape. The Dolores is completely hosed. The Delta is hosed. That's because of depletions of the amount of water. Grand Canyon is sort of a recreate, I'm being utterly casual. I would have gotten, I would have been fired if I said this when I was chief of GCMRC. But the Grand Canyon is a completely Disneyland situation in which we maintain flows so we can run 37 foot motor rigs through the rapids. Um, but up in the upper basin, there is real hope of maintaining the native ecosystem because we have that natural snowmelt pulse. But, um, the upper basin states are going to have to decide to have less diversions, and that's an immensely difficult political battle. Yeah. Okay. But the one thing I would say is part of this conversation is that we're sort of adding to the conversation the thermal regimes of the rivers make a tremendous difference. And that's based on where you store the water. And I've uh, mentioned Dibble et al. It was published in January of last year, ecological applications, where we make the case that thermal regime is what matters. Thanks, Thanks Jack. Um, just did you wanna say something? No, nope. that, that, that's fine. But so, we're a few minutes past, but if you can stick around for one more question, Sean Smith has a question. He doesn't know if his mic is working. So hopefully it will. If not, I'll read it for him. Sean, give it a try. Not working. All right, I'm going to read Sean's question. I recall saying that Las Vegas withdraws more than allocated under the allocation agreements but makes up for the excess by sending back return flows for net compliance. Is that a process substantial enough to matter to decisions regarding uses? Is reuse and return in the list of management solutions, or is it trivial relative to the rest of the water budget problems? Are they concerned about water quality changes from increased return flows from urban and ag? Um, you're absolutely right. The, the net, the, um, under the Colorado River Compact, if we use look at this, um, 
Uh, California gets 4.4 million acre feet of uh, main stem water. Arizona gets 2.8 million acre feet of main stem water. Nevada gets 0.3, 300,000 acre feet of water. Why? Because those allocation agreements are based on sort of the political power and populations of these places 100 years ago. Uh, here, um, that water fuels the economy of Las Vegas, and Las Vegas is one of the most progressive water conserving places in the West. And they do return a significant amount of water back to Lake Mead. But the number, I think their return flow is less than 100,000 acre feet. So their return flow is 0.1 relative to 9.5 moving through today. So it's a very small number. And I would say that the issues of increased efficiency and returning water, whether from municipalities or agriculture, albeit the water has herbicides, pesticides, or municipal waste, um, I'm not aware that at the grand scale of the Colorado River, it's a significant issue, even though it's a significant issue at at small local watershed scales. Other than that, I don't know the answer. That's the best I know. Yeah, anyway. All right. Well, I think we are, uh, looks like we're out of time here. Jack, really appreciate this. Um, it's been a really fascinating talk. And obviously, this conversation could go on for hours if we try to delve into all the complexities. So I hope that the audience has gained something from this. We do uh, record these seminars. This will be posted on the, um, it will be posted on the YouTube channel of the UMBC Center for Social Science Scholarship. Most likely, we will have that up by end of day today or sometime tomorrow. So, for people who want to watch it afterwards or refer to others, um, it will be available. Um, thanks so much, Jack. It's great to see you. Um, and uh, hope to hear from you again. Thank you. And uh, I'm headed to the down to Salt Lake City this afternoon. And for the next two days. There's a big conference uh, with every major stakeholder and a few of us academic gadflies. Uh, and I'll be talking about the Colorado. We're, we're all talking about the Colorado River. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. And thanks to all my friends uh, back east and in Maryland. I have really fond memories of my time there. And it's great to see everybody still healthy and making a difference. And uh, thanks to all of you. Okay, great. I'm going to stop the recording now. And we are.